Hey guys, it's John Watts. Welcome to our video. We're going to cover another case decision, and this particular one will involve the FDCPA, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, and specifically Section 1692G. That's sometimes called the validation section. And that's where the debt collector has to give you notice of certain rights that you have. And the question in this case is, okay, the debt collector did that, but then a second letter the debt collector sent, did that overshadow or contradict the first letter that gave you notice of your rights? And this particular case is from the Birmingham Federal Court, and this is on May 10, 2019. The lawyers involved, I know the lawyers on both sides are excellent lawyers, and I haven't read the arguments made. I'm just reading the judge's opinion. But I'm confident that both sides made very good arguments. And just like in any contest, somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. In this particular case, the debt collector wins. And so we want to know, well, why did the debt collector win? What's the judge's analysis here? And what can we learn about the FDCPA? So I hope that you find this interesting. This is Erica Cooper versus Atlantic Credit and Finance. And we have here a couple of defendants. We've got Atlantic Credit and Finance and Midland Funding. So Midland Funding is one of the largest debt buyers, debt collectors around. And they filed just a tremendous number of lawsuits in Alabama. And sometimes they use Midland Credit Management to actually be sort of their collection arm. Uh, but in this particular case, and this is we see this from time to time, they're using Atlantic Credit and Finance as sort of their own debt collector. Now, Midland Funding is still a debt collector. And if you remember from the last case decision video we did, we talked about is a debt buyer that then gets another collection agency to collect on, is that debt buyer a debt collector? And the Third Circuit Court of Appeals said, yes, they're still a debt collector. So here the... The question is, let me just highlight this part for you. So 1692G is that validation. 1692F is the unfair conduct. And you're welcome to go back and look at the videos where we go through the specific text of each of those sections. So the question is, did that second letter overshadow or contradict the first letter? And then was it also unfair or unconscionable? So the defendant attacks the lawsuit under Rule 12b-6. And this is what's called a motion to dismiss, and we'll cover that a little bit more. And then the plaintiff replied, and the court says that's granted. And I just want to take a moment and say, this is a magistrate judge, it's Judge England, and he's a very good judge in the Birmingham area, Northern District of Alabama. And so real quick, we have Article Three judges. Those are judges appointed for life. And then magistrate judges are appointed for a period of time. But it, at least in Alabama, when a magistrate judge gets a case, and they get a lot of the cases, the parties have the option to agree to let that magistrate judge serve as the final say in the case. And just like an Article Three judge that's appointed for life. And most of the time, the parties will agree to this because we have very good magistrate judges here. Now, I've talked with lawyers in other places who have told me that maybe their magistrate judges are not <laughs> quite so good. But here we have very good judges. And so it's pretty common that uh, people will consent to the magistrate judge making the final decision. If you don't do that, the magistrate judge still will run the case and they will issue what's called a recommendation. And then if anybody opposes that, they can go up to the sort of the Article Three District Court judge, and then that judge can decide whether to accept or reject it. But here, the Judge England's gonna be the final say on this. Now, in, any party can take this to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, but I just wanted to explain that part. So here's the background. We're really talking about two letters. That's all we're talking about two letters, and there's no dispute about the first letter. It's really the second letter that this whole lawsuit is built on. So the first letter is sent October 3rd, and that'll come up, be important here in just a moment. And it has this validation notice, and that's what's required under 1692G. And so the judge points out, 
it, here's what it says. It advises the consumer, you've got some rights, like the right to dispute in writing within 30 days. And if you exercise that right, then the defendants would suspend their collection efforts while they respond to that. Now we have another video talking about this. Basically a debt collector can do nothing. They don't have to respond, but they can't collect anything. Or they could respond. In other words, they could verify or validate that debt. And then the third option is they can get rid of the debt. They can send it back to where it came from or transfer it to another debt collector. So here the first letter has this information and it also says, look, Midland has bought the debt and has been placed with Atlantic. And this is key. And some debt collectors do this, some don't. Some will wait until that 30 day period that you have to request validation. They'll wait till that expires. But this company did not do that. So before that 30 days expired, remember the first letter was October 3rd. They sent a second letter about 10 days later, dated October 13. And it talks about, we may send this out to a lawyer and we may file a lawsuit. You've got a couple options to settle this. And then it has this kind of this disclaimer language that says, these payment opportunities do not alter or amend your validation rights as described in a previous letter. And then the, uh, the consumer who filed suit on this attach those letters to the lawsuit, which that can be very useful. It also has some consequences to doing that. And so here the judge says, let me explain to you what we're doing here. And Rule 12b-6 is what's called a motion dismiss. And that's where the defendant saying, look, there's no way that the plaintiff, the consumer, can win in this case. And so the way the judge tests this is to say, all right, is it plausible that what, what the consumer, the plaintiff, the one who filed the lawsuit, what they put forward, is it plausible? Not is it guaranteed they'll win or is it 75% chance they'll win or 50-50? It's just, is it plausible? And so here we say plausible is when plaintiff pleads factual content, allows the court to draw the reasonable inference that the defendant is liable for the misconduct. And we're talking about more than a sheer possibility, okay? And so the way the courts have been instructed to look at this is, hey, use your experience, use some common sense, and say, is this something that it is possible, not just a mere possibility, but it, it, there's some evidence or some indication that the plaintiff can be successful in this? And... All doubts are supposed to be given in favor of the one bringing the lawsuit. And so it's a pretty high burden to get a case dismissed, but it's a very common tactic by defendants, particularly debt collectors who are sued. I'm not sure that I remember the last case we filed where we did not get a motion to dismiss. I mean, it's just almost a knee-jerk reaction to file these things. And normally the court cannot look at anything other than the allegations in the complaint. In other words, they can't look at documents or affidavits or anything like that. But because these letters were attached to the complaint, the court is allowed to look at those. And if the documents contradict what's in the lawsuit, then at least in a general sense, the exhibits are supposed to control. Now, that's not an absolute rule. But we'll see how it plays out here. So here's the analysis. We're talking about section 1692G. And this is telling us that as a debt collector, you give the proper notice, but then what you do in that notice or after that notice cannot overshadow or contradict or be inconsistent. So here's the allegation that this has happened. And the defendants say, well, look, you haven't shown anything in that second letter that overshadows or contradicts. And so let's back up here. Let me just highlight down to here. 1692GA says you've got to send this validation notice. And it's either the initial communication or within five days. 
And it basically says you have 30 days after receipt to challenge the validity and seek verification of the debt. And after that period has expired, assuming that no request has been sent by the consumer, debt collector may assume the debt's valid. Here we go. If the consumer exercises her right to dispute, the debt collector must suspend its collection efforts pending a response. And if the consumer does not challenge it, then they the debt collector is allowed to continue to collect. Now, whether you exercise your rights under 1692G or not, and we've talked about this in other videos, the debt collector still has to follow the rest of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. In other words, that's not a free pass, do whatever they want. So here, the consumer did not exercise her rights. And so the court points out that that 30-day validation period is not a grace period. It's not a situation where the debt collector is forbidden to take any collection activity. It's just if you exercise your rights under that 30 days, then the collector has to stop and respond to that or do nothing, no further collection, or get rid of the debt. And so the court points out that there is this kind of balancing act here. You have the right to dispute and the collector has the right to collect. And so the, the court and the law strike a balance here. And one of those, and this is a specific section, uh, subsection G of 1692G, it says that collection activity that the debt collector can engage in must not overshadow or be inconsistent. And we look at that under what's called the least sophisticated consumer. And that just means we're not saying what does the actual consumer who's bringing the lawsuit, what did they know or not know? You know, we don't care if they are a banker and maybe they know about all this stuff. Or they, you know, are a law school professor that teaches. We don't care about that. We say, what would a least sophisticated consumer uh, think about this? And that's the standard. Now, I think this case points out, other cases point out, least sophisticated consumer does not mean that you close your eyes to what's actually said or you take unreasonable positions. It's just saying that we don't expect you to be an expert in this. And so the debt collector needs to be very, very clear with what they're doing. And so the allegation is that the second letter that was sent on, I think, October 13th, violated the FDCPA by demanding payment before the 30-day and by threatening litigation. And so we have to look at the language here of the second letter. And so it starts off, oh, we made several attempts to contact you. We're considering forwarding this account to an attorney in your state for possible litigation. Call us. We may proceed. And it, here are two ways to resolve the debt. One is paying 800 bucks. And notice the date, October 31st. So the first letter was October 3rd. So this is within that 30-day window, and that's going to be significant. And the other option is you make $25 uh, payments until it's paid in full. And then the court is really going to zero in on this. These payment opportunities do not alter or amend your validation rights as described in our previous letter to you. And so here we go. The court says, look, it expressly disclaims any effect it might have on the validation rights and refers to the previous letter. And the court says, you know, when you have multiple letters, you're supposed to read them in connection with each other. And so the court says, thus, when reading second letter, even the least sophisticated consumer would be triggered to look back at the first letter. That was October 3rd, which outlines her validation rights, and then figure out how these fit together. And the court says, the second letter did not demand payment prior to the end of the validation period or threaten litigation payment was not received during validation period such that it would overshadow or contradict. Now, as a factual matter, it did demand payment before the validation. Remember, that was option number one. Let me go back up here. This would be October 31st. Well, that's within that 30-day time period. So what the court is saying is 
yes, I understand it did demand payment before the end of that 30 days, but it did not do so in a way that would overshadow or contradict the validation. So now the court's going to go into more detail. So demand for immediate payment. And the court says, look, you've got two options, one of which is within that uh, 30-day period and one is beyond it. And the court says, hey, this is allowable. Debt collector is free to provide a deadline by which settlement offer will expire that is less than 30 days. And the consumer makes an interesting argument here. And again, I haven't read the brief, so I don't know if there were other arguments and the court just focused on this one. But it says, Cooper's contention second letter did not indicate this was a settlement that would satisfy the debts and start contrast with the letter. And I'll tell you this, going back and reading this, if a consumer came to me and said, hey, I got this letter. It said I could pay, you know, 800 bucks by October 31st. I paid that money and they're still collecting. They're still calling me. They're still writing me letters. They still have a balance on my credit report. I would say, oh, we're going to hammer these debt collectors because they clearly said in here, this would resolve the debt. So make arrangements to resolve the debt, a one-time repayment amount. And so I think that's pretty clear that they are saying that this would resolve the debt. So come back here. Cooper's contention second letter did not indicate this was a settlement. Start contrast with the letter. I, I think the court's right on that. And then it says the second payment you know, was a structured payment, no time frame to respond. And the court says, you know, this these would resolve the account. You fulfill the obligation, release from the obligation. And so the court concludes with least sophisticated consumer. It's not plausible that the opportunity to pay would overshadow or uh, restrict the, the debtor's validation rights. And so then it says nothing else in the second letter can be read to demand payment during the validation period. Now, if we just take that sentence in isolation, that's not correct because it does demand payment within the 30-day period. I think what the court's saying here is that such that it would overshadow that original validation notice. And so I think this will give us some insight here. Cooper's reliance on the Bartlett case is misplaced. Bartlett, let me just go ahead and highlight this whole thing. Bartlett held the letter following language, contradicted the rights. If you wish to resolve the matter before legal action is commenced, you must do one of the two things within one week. Well, that one week would be less than 30 days. And so the court summarizes this and says, Bartlett, the demand and validation were in the same letter. So again, they're saying, you've got 30 days to dispute this, but if you don't pay within a week, then you know we're going to sue you. Well, that's pretty easy to see that that contradicts your 30-day window. And here the court says second letter doesn't have that type of instruction or demand, and it references you back to the first letter, which does tell you you've got 30 days. All right, so the next part is this threatening litigation. So the question is, when the second letter within that 30-day period, remember the dates, October 3rd, first letter, October 13th, second letter, and second letter says, if you don't get in touch with us, we don't hear from you, then we may send this to a lawyer to sue you. Does that overshadow the first letter that gives you 30 days to dispute this debt and request validation? And the court again points out, hey, your right to dispute coexists with the right to collect, at least until you do dispute the debt. And so here we have, the court's just kind of repeating what the letter says, and the judge says, this language is within your right to continue collection efforts during the validation period. And let me just highlight the rest of this here. So the language, the second letter, does not indicate the time for disputing the debt has passed or misrepresent or confuse the amount of time remaining to dispute the debt. And then it encourages the debtor to contact the collector you know, to, to make arrangements on this. Now, to me, this is a closer question because 
there is no time frame set forth in that second letter. It doesn't say, like it, it would be easy if it said, if you don't contact us within five days and we're going to sue you. Well, that would be overshadowing or contradicting the validation contained in the first letter. But it's kind of vague. You know, if we don't hear from you, then we may send this out to a lawyer to sue you. Oh, and by the way, we're not uh, taking away any of your rights in the first letter. So I'm not sure I would have reached the same decision as Judge England did here, but I understand where he's coming from. If you take that first letter, it says you've got 30 days. And I think what the judge, even though it's not stated, I think what the judge is probably looking at here is saying, well, look, consumer, you did not dispute it within the 30 days, and they did not sue you within the 30 days. Now, if, let's remember our dates, October 3rd, first letter, October 13th, second letter. What if they had filed suit on October 20? Well, then I think the judge would have taken a different approach here and said, suing that quick That might have been a problem here. But the judge here does not find it's a problem. And here's the conclusion. Does not contain any overt misinformation, apparent contradiction, lack of clarity. And so you have failed to state a claim. And so we're getting rid of your 1692G claim. Now, there's one more claim that the consumer has, 1692F. And that's just when you're when a collector is doing something that's unfair or unconscionable. And there are some specific examples, and you can refer back to our video on 1692F. But there's also sort of a catch-all that says anything that's, that's unfair, and the court's going to discuss that. So here we have kind of a catch-all, may not use unfair or unconscionable, And remember, 1692A is a list of definitions. We have a video on that. And these are not defined. So it's just going to look at, the court's going to look at just normal definition. So what is unfair? It's injustice, partiality, deception. Well, what's unconscionable? It's shockingly unfair or unjust. So it's a step beyond unfair. Now, the reason the, the... statute uses this word is unconscionable does have a legal definition and it's more of looking at again when something's really unfair or the bargaining power between two people if they're making a contract is just all out of whack and maybe you're not given a chance to read the contract but here the court's approaching it just kind of the normal definition of it um, here's a legal definition from Black's Law Dictionary. No conscience, unscrupulous, showing no regard for conscience, affronting the sense of justice. And you get the idea. It just strikes you at a kind of a visceral level, you know, just in your gut where you go, well, that's really, really unfair what they did. And the court says, okay, look, you did not allege anything, Miss Consumer, beyond what you already said in 1692G. There's nothing else. And, you know, the court says it's a catch-all, but it's not a free-for-all. And so most courts will say, look, if, if this fits another provision of the FDCPA, then you don't really need this sort of general 1692F. Now, the exception to that would be there are specific aspects or illustrations under 1692F that the, the law says these are unfair or unconscionable, and you could have overlap. But when it's just kind of a general catch-all thing, the, normally the courts say, well, if it really is a 1692D or E or whatever it might be, and you don't fit in that, then you're not going to fit in 1692F. And so the court says, it does not follow that conduct that is expressly allowed under one provision, that's at 1692G, is actionable under another, 1692F. And again, this is not an absolute true statement, but in general, this is true. Purpose of a catch-all provision is address conduct that is not addressed under the enumerated provisions of a statute. And since 1692G allows this, uh, let me highlight this, uh, you know, it, it addresses collection practices, communications during that validation period, that 30-day period, then the same conduct would not be 
a violation under 1692F. And then the, the court has recently stated something, and I don't know if this is Judge England or this is just another judge in Northern District, but where both claims are based on the same facts, failure to state a claim under one section means you failed to state a claim under 1692F. Now, the court does point out there is an appeal pending there. And so he tosses the 1692F claim and then says, look, all your claims are gone, so the case is dismissed. And now I don't know if this has been appealed or not. It, it may be, or the parties may have settled it even after this, or the consumer may have said, well, I took a shot, I lost, I'll walk away from that. Whenever you lose a case, whichever side of this you're on, you do have to evaluate your options. Is there a chance to settle? Is there an opportunity to appeal? Is this worth continuing to pursue? Or are you just kind of pouring good money after bad money, so to speak? So if we go down there and get a verdict against somebody, and I'm trying to think all of our verdicts against debt collectors in federal court, none of them have been appealed. They've all been resolved. And part of that is, you know, debt collector loses and they say, do we want to just keep shelling out a ton of money for our lawyers and ultimately for the consumer's lawyers? It, we've already lost once. We're probably going to lose again. So we're just wasting money here. And from the consumer side, we have to look at it also and say, well, is this worth it for our client to continue to pursue this? But I, coming back to this case, th this gives us a good discussion. And I always like cases where you know, the consumer wins, because that's what I do, as I represent consumers. But we have to look at both sides of this and, and see where the consumer wins and where the debt collector wins. And this gives us a good analysis of this overshadowing or contradicting the validation notice. So I hope you enjoyed this. And as long as you guys continue to like these types of videos, then I'll continue to make them. Uh, I'll tell you this, and I, I don't say this in an egotistical or arrogant way, but I think I'm pretty good at this stuff. I teach lawyers around the nation about this. Uh, but this is very helpful to me to sort of make myself go through in depth the new cases that come out. And there's that old expression, if you really want to learn something, you teach it. And so I can read through it kind of quickly and go, okay. But then if I read through it and say, well, I've got to explain this, and I'm sure you guys realize that I'm not working off a script or anything. I'm just going through highlighting stuff, talking. I don't have an outline or anything like that. Uh, so I had to give it some thought before I turn on record, hopefully. And uh, so this is helpful to me. If it's helpful to you guys, then I will continue to do this. And if you have any questions, you can put them below if it's kind of a general question. If it's you know something specific or private, then you know just reach out to us at alabamaconsumer.com. Uh, or you can email me, John at Watts Herring, that's W-A-T-T-S, Herring, H-E-R-R-I-N-G dot com. John at Watts Herring dot com. Okay, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.